Uh, ben, Christoph, Sisters of Mercy, how are you doing today? Very good, thank you. And again, happy birthday to you. Thank you. Um, it's been a while since the Sisters of Mercy played in the United States. Any particular reason for that? Um, I think it was a matter of the last tour that we did there, for whatever particular reasons, it um, it wasn't it wasn't the best one, and that wasn't any fault of the fans. It was just a I think the band was in a, an odd place at that time, um, and it was two thousand and eight, and um, I think there are certain things that have to align for it to work to come over and play somewhere like the US and Australia or or places where it's a bit further afield, and those things just didn't come into line until very recently. Did they align right now? <laughs> yeah, so they're alive now, so we're we're good. What has to be in place? Um, I think it's all sorts of aspects of having the right kind of um, contact on the ground in America as well to set up the right kind of shows. And we really wanted to come over and make sure that we were playing the kinds of venues that we felt really suited what the Sisters of Mercy were about. And that's less so your kind of chain venues and more so interesting independent venues. And what should we expect as far as the show goes? Um, it's it's kind of, <laughs> it's going to be very visually interesting, very visually exciting. We've got a great light show, sonically very exciting as well. And it should be, if it's anything like what we just did in Australia, it should be a really good mix of big hits, deep cuts, and some new songs. Wow. Um, what's been going on in the Sister of Mercy camp over the last few years, since we're not too privy to, to all these things that are happening? Well, there was a big shift in 2019 when we got a new guitar player, the Australian Dylan Smith. Dylan I'd known for about 10 years just on the London scene and um, through other sort of projects. I worked in his band for a while as his guitar player. And he's a great multi-instrumentalist songwriter, fantastic guy, really great fun, good energy. And um, we were looking for a new guitar player for the band. And weirdly, it was one of those sort of you can't see the wood for the tree situation. It was such an obvious choice that I didn't think of him straight away. And um, and then when I asked him if he'd be interested, he was just you know blown away. He was a big fan of the sisters since a kid. And um, he came to the audition and it was pretty clear even though the other guys who came were very, very skilled musicians, there was something about Dylan that felt right for this band and that Andrew, I think, instantly connected with. What also made Dylan a very strong contender for this was not only was he a great musician, he also has so many other skills in terms of speaking a number of languages, being able to drive an HGV, um, these kind of things that Andrew holds in high regard, as well as just being good to play at the instrument. There's all these other aspects as well. So that was a big shift when Dylan joined the band and it changed the band dynamic because it sort of changed my position as well. I'd been the new guy for, at that point, 13 years. And then suddenly I wasn't new guy anymore. So it gave me a bit more of um, a sense of position in the band where I was actually able to bring a lot more of my songwriting ideas to the table. And um, that then suddenly meant the presence of Dylan, who was also a fan, like I was, meant that we all suddenly felt very much on the same page when it came to writing. And that was a very prolific time that between 2019 and 2021, 22, we wrote 15, 20 more songs, new songs. Um, and so then we started showcasing those songs when we played a show in the, uh, well, we played a couple of shows at the start of 2020, then pandemic, then Weirdly, we played three shows at the end of 2021 where we played some new songs. And then since 2022, we've been touring a lot and again, showcasing more of these new songs. Ben, tell me about your musical background. Um, what sort of thing? Like, how did you kind of grow up musically? How did you go from a fan to a musician and, and, and whatnot? Well, I... I was very lucky that I've got an uncle who was only eight years older than me. So he was a bit like a big brother, but cooler than a brother because you didn't have to spend that much time with him. So it was kind of like the best of both worlds of someone that you look up to. And yet you have enough distance from them to 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 have um, like a that real kind of admiration. So he liked so many of the bands and cultural things that I still like today. He set me on my path and 
one of those things was Sisters of Mercy, but we moved towards that where he first got me into like classic rock of ACDC, Judas Priest, Def Leppard, Bon Jovi, The Cult was a big one, Killing Joke, Nine Inch Nails, and it sort of moved towards me liking the Sisters of Mercy through the influence that my uncle had on me. He also started to play guitar. I wanted to be like him. I started to play guitar. And um, that was really where it started, having this very strong role model um, who inspired me uh, on my musical path. Hmm. Um, when did you first join the Sisters of Mercy? I mean, you've mentioned you were the new guy for a long while. So how, under what circumstances did it happen? It was 2006. And at the time, I was working in a, um, a wine shop, um, which it's that sounds far grander than it really was. It was essentially like a 7-Eleven. Um, and I was had just moved to London and I was teaching a little bit and I was guitar and I was trying to get my own band off the ground. And I just got a call one day from a mysterious number and a mysterious man who said, we might want you to be in our band. And I said, well, what band is it? Hadn't even introduced himself. I'm not going to tell you. Well, what's the music like? I'm not going to tell you. So it was this, I was very confused as to what exactly I was being asked to audition for, but I was told that they had a tour of America and that I should come and bring some Hendrix licks to the audition. Um, so I went along to this thing, feeling very much like, is this a joke? Are these guys for real? I still knew nothing about what I was auditioning for. And when I went into the audition, there were three guys in the room. There was a guy with a laptop. There was a guy uh, with a guitar. And there was a guy with a can of beer, a woolly hat, and a pair of dark glasses on. Um, and still, no introductions, no idea what I was doing there or who this was. Now, they started to play some drums from the computer, and bass, some riffs. Can you play this riff? Yeah, OK. What about if you play a solo over this? Yeah, OK. Because I can't read music, but I'm good at picking up things by ear. And so um, I started to notice that these riffs they were asking me to play had a kind of Sisters of Mercy feel to them. And I thought, because as I, as I was already a fan, but I hadn't seen any up-to-date photos of the band for a while. I hadn't really looked online at what they'd been up to. I... Last time I'd listened to the band had been maybe the year before, just listening to the greatest hits again or whatever. So I didn't make a connection at all. And it taught me that um, the way that we recognize other people is a lot to do with context. I was playing for um, a side story to prove this point is I was playing with a different band a couple of years ago and I was sat in the dressing room in Toronto and this middle-aged ginger man walks into the room. Um, I think, who's this? Um, is it like the cleaner or something or security? And it took me a second to realize, oh, it's James Hetfield. Because I wasn't expecting James Hetfield to walk into the room. I didn't recognize him as James Hetfield until I was, oh, oh my God, it's James Hetfield. Um, so this was a similar situation. I had no idea who these guys were. I had no context. I had no background. It was just some blokes. Um, and so... It was that clue of this riff sounds a bit like the Sisters of Mercy. Um, and I later realized it was one of their newer songs that they'd written, um, but never recorded. So it had that feel to it, but it wasn't one I could have heard on the record. And so I thought, I know, I'm just going to right here, right now with my guitar, I'm going to play a classic Sisters riff and see if anybody says anything. Because if they don't say anything, then, well, it's just me playing on my guitar. If they do say something, then, well, we're on to something. So I played the riff from a song called Dr. G. And instantly, the guy with the can of beer, the woolly hat and the glasses goes, that's one of our songs. From that moment, I was so nervous. I can vividly remember looking down and I remember my hands were shaking because I realized I was in the presence of a band that I hugely admired, that was a hugely successful definitive iconic influential band um, arguably one of the most influential in its genre and here was me with the chance to be part of it so I was really nervous and in hindsight I'm very very grateful that I didn't know what I was auditioning for because it meant I went in with this real blasé sense of whatever I'll just be me almost actually feeling a little bit superior as in, who are these losers let's see let's show them what I can do um so it actually worked out rather well. And a couple of days later, nothing was said at the time. A couple of days later, I got a phone call. I was 
in the wine shop again. And um, it was the it was the it was the man again who I'd now figured out was the man with the shades and the woolly hat that was Andrew Eldridge. And he said, "Yeah, we we think you're our guy. We'd like you to to join the band." And it, it was incredible because that was just December two thousand and five, and by February two thousand and six, I was playing my first show with them in Las Vegas. Well, luckily, you were not blindfolded and driven to an undisclosed location. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly, but that wouldn't. I wouldn't have put it past them to do that. Yeah. Um, so now being in um, Sisters of Mercy for a while, how would you describe, how, how does that band function? In, in what sense? Like any sense. Like, how does it work? Um, uh, <laughs> it's an interesting dynamic because you've, you've got now four very different people who have very different skill sets um, who understand where their place is within that machine um so for example if it ever comes to anything to do with vocal harmonies that's my job if it's anything to do with acoustic guitar playing that's dylan's job anything to do with tech that's Kreft's job anything to do with lyrics to do with the overall identity of the band and the branding and the imagery and the logos that's von andrew so it's um and then a lot of the other things are quite open when it comes to set lists we'll talk about okay which how should we do this we'll make suggestions um people's ideas will be taken on board it's just there are certain areas that certain people are really good at so if it's some sort of work on um doing an interview and um uh or, or writing something um to 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 sort of convey mine and Dylan's opinions on something then I'll do that but if it comes to doing something more practical he'll do it and again anything that's to do with computers that's definitely Kreft's world um yeah how would you describe your relationship with the man in the wool hat Andrew Eldridge the man in the wool hat um <clears throat> well he's um he's always been he's always been very um encouraging and supportive of um my development as a songwriter and as a musician. So when I first came to the band, I was 25 years old and I just wanted every song that I played to showcase what I could do 100%. So I'd always try and get guitar solos into songs or if there was a simple riff, I'd try and overcomplicate it because I want people to see that I'm good or what I perceived as good, which at that time was to be technical. Um, and he taught me the necessity of playing three notes, but just playing them as well as you possibly can with feeling, with emphasis, with drama. He taught me how to stand, walk to the edge of the stage and just put your foot on the monitor and just and just stare at the crowd. You don't have to be like rocking out from the start. You can build to that. Um, he taught me about a lot of the Atlantic label bands um, from, from, the, from the last century and, and where a lot of his influences came from when it comes to that kind of genre of music. We listened to Al Green, Booker T, and when I joined the band, uh, and, and Sam and Dave, a lot of a lot of those kind of Atlantic artists, in order to, I for me to understand where each part of the machine fits together when it comes to to, to songwriting, um, and to playing, and so I find now that when I sit down to write for any band, um, I've got that sort of Eldritch mentality in my head of, okay, this is five notes, but how can I make it into three notes and make it really effective as three notes maybe even two notes um that's too many notes now you know and and um also the interplay between things okay well that's where the vocal's going so this little guitar lick has to come after it it can't come at the same time there could be some overlap but we've got to think what is the focus here so in terms of that side of things he's he's been uh very much a mentor when it comes to the construction of songwriting and and writing individual riffs and melodies and being part of a of a band um, as a machine, which I guess in a very literal sense, we do have Dr. Avalanche, who is a machine. Excellent. Actually, that brings me to my next question, and let's have some fun with this one. Um, the second longest running and, as Andrew said, the most dependable member of Sister of Mercy is Dr. Avalanche. What is your relationship with him? Well, that's interesting because Dr. Avalanche is a bit like Doctor Who. It's a bit like James Bond. He's a bit like, um, um, oh, who else is a good example? A Batman, whereby the actual, the actual, um, 
the, the core element of the Doctor remains the same. But the host body changes. So he it's not fair because he's consistently getting a, a new host body every couple of years. So he will be eternal. He will live forever. He will outlive us all. Um, and there's this undefinable spirit of the Doctor that we just carries on, sustains through the rest of time. Because his original form was a very, very simple drum machine in, I guess, 1981. Long live Dr. Avalanche. Quite literally, yeah. Um, you've mentioned that new music is being written. Tell me more. What does it sound like? It's like a combination of the first three records, but with a modern spin on it. So you've got the kind of jangly, acoustic -y, um atmospherics of the first record. You've got the expansive cinematic quality of the second, and you've got the harder edge of the third. And then you've got something new, which we brought in simply by the fact that we are us in 2023. Cool. Um, any chance of any of it uh, being released? Well, a lot of it's already on YouTube. And because the nature, in, in terms of live recordings, and because the nature of people's camera phones now is so much better than it was 10 years ago, it was to my surprise, actually, that a younger fan said, oh, I'm to be, come up, he comes to me after the show and he said, um, oh, I've been loving the new songs. I've been listening to them all the time. I listen to them on my walk to university. And I said, well, how do you listen to them? He said, I just make a YouTube playlist of the live songs and I listen to them like that. So the way that people consume music is, is, is so different. Because um, you kind of think of a live recording as being some terrible bootleg from like 1994 that someone's done on, a, on like a sort of dodgy cassette player. But now the clarity and the fidelity can be really strong, strong enough for this kid to have made a playlist that he happily listens to on his on his way to, to college. Um, so in a way, the works have been have been recorded and people know them. And I look down and people know the words when I'm, we're playing these unreleased works. People know the words in, in, in the first few rows. Um, so it's um, it's great to see to, to see people picking up on it and learning it by the nature of the Internet. Of course, it would be amazing to hear also what they were like in a studio form. So there you go. Is there any label interest at this point? Um, well, that's um, something whereby I think there's always going to be label interest. Um, I think this band is in a fortunate position where it's got such a unassailable brand and such an inveterate brand, but a record company would be interested i think we're very interested in 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 releasing an album from this band because the fan base already exists and that's the that's the key struggle with any um with any kind of any label has in in getting a new band off the ground is how do you create a fan base well we've already got one we've got one that is literally millions of people across the globe and so um there's always going to be interest and i think there's there's something quite comforting in the fact that if there comes the time where we do want to do that, it would be pretty easy for us to do that. Um, I don't feel like we have to do it ourselves or crowdfund it or anything like that. I think we 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 have a really strong platform. Um, so yeah, I think there will always be interest. Oh, that's definitely true. Uh, now speaking of the old records, um, to me each of Mercy album represents a different stage of the band. Um, which one do you personally gravitate to the most? Uh, that's a really good question because it's one of those things whereby um, my favourite Sisters of Mercy album would be a combination of songs of all from all three albums, <laughs> so it would be a bit of a uh, of a best of. Um, but and, but they're so different. But at the same time, I think that the spirit of Eldritch carries across and gives this um, consistency across all three records, which are quite markedly different records musically. Um, when I think of myself as a fan, just by the nature of how I discovered the albums, it was Vision Thing was first. The first song I ever heard was When You Don't See Me. And that connected with me because it had a lot of the tropes and aesthetics of classic rock, classic arena rock, which was my first love. Um, you know, big production, big guitars, synths, huge drums. Um, so Vision Thing was the first album that I sort of bought into. And then um, I heard the Temple of 92, Temple of Love, which again, it um, fulfilled so many of those, um, those, those kind of areas that I like about music. 
But it was like I was discovering huge arena rock, yet this time it wasn't just these kind of throwaway kind of lyrics. It was sophisticated, ambiguous, um, visceral lyrics that had this level of intrigue to them that I'd not experienced before. So as a teenager, it was the perfect balance of intrigue and, and mystery and and a certain level of kind of um of 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 sort of aggression and as i said this kind of visceral spite and whilst it was still hugely catchy and memorable and rocking so the vision thing album really kind of captured my imagination to begin with then i worked backwards from there and i really got into the first album i thought it had such a wonderful atmosphere to it the um the first and last and always even though I could, I could, I could see holes in the production. I could see holes in some of the, some songs were markedly stronger than others, etc. Um, and then Floodland was always a weird one for me because it's got some of the best songs on it, and yet I never liked this corrosion. I just, I didn't, I never liked it. I thought it was silly and cheesy and went on for ten minutes. Um, and I understand now, in hindsight, that that was kind of the point. He wrote it because he wanted to sort of make fun of the of the of, of, of the of the industry at the time of how having a silly hook that goes hey now now in it would become successful and of course it did so the joke kind of absolutely worked and it is silly and it is poppy and it does appear on the 80s best jobs next to like Yazoo and Nick Kershaw because it, it seems to fall into that remit whereas no other sister song does. So it's always quite interesting that that song has had, I, I think it's great and, and, and it makes complete sense that it's had this huge mainstream appeal. And yet no one, I, I think, has ever gone, why is that on a Sisters of Mercy album? It's really kind of hoppy and, um, and, a, bit, and a bit silly. And now in hindsight, I understand why. Um, and I guess the imagery and the, and, and the iconography that goes with the song and the video meant that it did fit in with Lucretia and Dominion and the other tracks. And also the fact that the lyrics are still really good, apart from the Hey Now Now. Um, the lyrics are still really ambiguous and, and really poetic and lyrical. And his voice as well is is ironic and mocking and dark and intriguing. And so, yeah, it's... Um, that's always been an interesting point for me is that when I look back, I never really liked that song. It would kind of would always skip that one. <laughs> yeah, the, the beauty of these records are they were different from each other, yet very unique at the same time. Yeah, 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 very much so. You, you can't really think of another album that's like Floodland or that's like Vision Thing or that's like First and Last. Um, and there are what you will hear is there are so many bands that try to essentially remake the first and last era sound with their music. Um, a lot of 90s bands you'll listen to, 90s sort of um, dark wave bands, it sounds like they're trying to do first and last and always again, the same voice, the same guitar sounds, um, the same sort of riffs. So it was a hugely influential. But what's really exciting is that, particularly as we approach this American tour, um, is that we're talking... Uh, you know, I've been in contact with with people from a lot of really well known industrial and metal bands and rock bands who from America who were like, oh my god, I'm so excited! You guys are coming. I'm a huge fan. And we're talking about people from bands like Lamb of God and Machine Head and um, and and you know these these huge metal and industrial bands who were influenced by the Sisters as kids because there was something about whatever Eldritch meant to them inspired them. And I found that in in, in 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 punk rock bands that I've met, in pop bands that I've met, in, in indie bands that I've met, that something about what the sisters did um during as they were growing up has, has carried forward with them for their entire life. Cool, cool. Um all right. Many speak of Andrew Eldridge as this dark character who can be controversial but when i spoke to him on the phone like 30 years ago he seemed like a regular guy who was just set in his ways probably does not compromise easily uh, so how do you view him in that in that sense um i think he's got he's he's, he's very um he's got a very 
good set of ideals. One of the things I really like about Andrew is that he has been very forward thinking his entire life about things to do with gender politics, to do with sexuality, to do with ethnicity, race, culture. Like he has always made this band for everybody. Um, and he's always been very vocal in his um in in his in his in in his resistance to oppression, Nazis, anything that is um seen as 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 um you know aggressive and and that sort of is um got, can't think of the right word, but that sort of marginalizes and 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 threatens people, whether that for whatever reasons that be. And I think that's something that maybe a lot of his peers couldn't necessarily say they were there from the start on that and he always has been and I've always really thought that was an amazing thing that and that, again I gravitated towards that element as well so uh, I think he's, he's he's got a very good strong moral compass when it comes to that stuff and he is he's very he's a deeply thoughtful person he has an amazing understanding of language and his understanding of sci-fi as well is really dense and complex and i've only scratched the surface on um a lot of sci-fi stuff and so we have some quite interesting conversations when maybe i'll discover something like for the first time i watched rollable or um um soylent green or something and these are some of the most iconic movies to him that he says reflect his world view so we can have some really interesting chats about stuff like that so it's funny that we don't really talk that much about music. We kind of, we do when we're actually in the rehearsal room, but not so much outside it, if at all. We just talk about books that we like or uh, particular sci-fi. Um, so it's quite intriguing and quite fun to be around someone who's so well known for music and yet we barely talk about it. <laughs> um, I really enjoy speaking with him uh, back then, uh, and and love the music, and and I think it's it's the personality is connected to what he's saying in these songs, um, and there's a certain deepness to it, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, finally, what do you look forward to uh, during the tour? During this tour, the United States tour. Well, I think. I'm really excited to be coming back as this version of the band because I think this is one of the strongest lineups that we've had for for years. For, and and the last tour that we did in Australia, it was just this wonderful um, uh, this wonderful sort of synergy of all the things that we've been working on for the last sort of three four years with a new lineup coming together and people's response and reaction to it being really strong. I'm so excited and proud to bring that to America. Whereas, you know, the last time that we played here in two, there in 2008 was certainly for me, almost like the, the one of the low points of my time in the band for various reasons. Um, now we're coming back and I think we're really good and we're playing a lot of songs that I've co-written, which is such a huge deal for me to be on the stage playing with this band songs that I've actually co-written um, and to get to play that to the audiences. I know that people in the States are super passionate about music and about, about this band. And I'm excited to deliver something which is both ticks both the box of their expectation of what they love about this band. And yet there are some surprises and some excitement that it's not just, Hey, here's a retro act coming back with some session guys. It's a fully forced rocking machine of, of, of 2023, which is comprised of people who are really passionate about taking this band forward. Thank you, Ben. It's been a pleasure talking. You're welcome. You're very welcome.